Hi, welcome back to Humanistic Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the fourth one in the series devoted to the great humanistic psychologist Carl Rogers, and more specifically to his book, On Becoming a Person. In the previous two videos, we covered chapter one out of that book, and in this video, we'll be covering chapter two out of the same book. But before we get into that, a couple things. First, let me get the hat of the day. Okay, so once again, Atlanta Braves get the hair under control. All right, so, okay, got that done. Uh, next thing is to tell you a little bit about the logical sequence of these chapters. Here's the way it's gonna work. Uh, the chapters in the beginning of our treatment are going to focus in a very general way on how Carl Rogers sees life, okay? And with each succeeding chapter, it's going to focus a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more on how he sees psychotherapy. So toward the end of our treatment of On Becoming a Person, we're going to be talking very specifically about the nuts and bolts of psychotherapy. So, chapter one, a very general chapter. But hopefully you heard it as in a way per pertinent to the whole idea of what psychotherapy is about, even though he's talking in a very general way about life. The other thing I should probably mention at this point is that we went through chapter one pretty slowly and methodically, but with each succeeding chapter, as you start to get sort of the hang of things, we'll go a little bit faster. So we'll probably pick up the pace a little bit with this video and then with the succeeding videos a little bit more. So uh, chapter two. Um, some hypotheses regarding the facilitation of personal growth. Okay, so kind of a long-winded title for a chapter, don't you think? But what he's trying to do with that sort of language is shift our vocabulary, both literal and conceptual, away from the predominant medical model view of psychological disturbance and toward a very different, more ontologically oriented view of the same thing. So he doesn't want to fall into the trap of using or deferring too quickly to medical sounding words like psychotherapy, for instance. Okay, so therapy is a term that derives from medical practice. Uh, the terms disorders or syndromes derive from physical medicine and so on. So that's the reason for the somewhat long-winded title. So some hypotheses regarding the facilitation of personal growth. So facilitation of personal growth is going to be a way of describing the essential movement of psychotherapy. So it's not going to be so much about pathology or treating or curing or medical type concepts like that. All right, so in your notes, I started out with a statement from page 33. By the way, I just discovered that the entire text of On Becoming a Person is available for free, dropping an F-bomb on you for free, via PDF on the internet. So if you uh, are a uh, penurious, <laughs> let's improve your vocabulary, that means not very rich, student, and you're, uh, you're saving every dime and every dollar, you can download it for free off the internet, which I had to do because my copies at the university and we're no, and we can't go to the university, we're not allowed into our offices still at this point. Okay, but at any rate, here's a quote on page 33. If I can provide a certain type of relationship, let's say I as a therapist, the other person, like a client, will discover within himself the capacity to use that relationship for growth and change and personal development will occur. Okay, so once again, big emphasis on the relationship. Let's remember what we said, I think it was in video number one, that for Rogers, the human interrelationship, the human relationship, that's what changes us Technique is in the service of that. We apply techniques to further the relationship. We don't have a relationship to use techniques. Rather, we use techniques to further the relationship. Okay, so emphasis on the relationship rather than on things like intellectual theorizing. We need to say this because, you know, we're in a university context where we tend to idolize the intellect, okay? or techniques and procedures, because ultimately all those do is yield relatively superficial or temporary change. Okay, so what he's really after is not just changing the client's thinking, not just changing the client's feelings, not just changing the client's behavior or anything else, not just changing the client's social relationships, but he's after change in the entire pattern of being, and hopefully this is not a shock to you at this point in the semester. So he's after 
change in the holistic sense, change in the entire pattern of life that we live out. Okay, so <laughs> he doesn't want just temporary changes. And it's, you know, it's easy to have sort of relatively temporary and changes in someone's life. It's like, well, you know, uh, a client comes to you uh, because let's say he's depressed, he has a form of depression like major depression or dysthymia is another form of depression in the DSM. So he comes to you, the therapist, for help with that. And uh, you know, if you aren't terribly holistic in your approach, you can easily slip into a trap like, well, you treat it as depression. Praise the Lord, you treat it as depression. Now he's got a drinking problem. Well, that's not necessarily progress just because you managed to convert his depressive symptoms into a the symptoms of alcoholism. All right. So what we're really after is changing the entire pattern of life. All right. So now here's where we get into the big three characteristics of a therapeutic relationship. According to Rogers, we mentioned these in the very first video in this series, but now we're going to look at them in much more detail. So number one, which hopefully you've semi remember at this point is going to be acceptance. And I glossed what that word means for you, a kind of non judgmental valuing of the other person as a distinct and worthwhile human being. Okay, to accept another person means a kind of non-judgmental valuing of the other person. A willingness for him to accept his own feelings in his own way. That's Roger's way of saying it on page 34 of your book. Okay, so non-judgmental valuing. Number two, empathy understanding the feelings, thoughts, and world of the other person as well as we can, okay? Realizing that we're never going to understand another person completely. Why? Because we can't know all the details of what he or she's been through or all the deepest recesses of his or her psyche. But the point is not to attain the absolute. The point is to do our best job anyhow, to try as best we can to understand another human being. Uh, and the way of thinking about this is to try to understand uh, his or her world as though you were looking at it from the inside, from his or her eyes. And once again, this is an ideal. You're never going to attain this in the absolute, but try to do the best you can anyhow. That's what the, uh, the point is, you know, to try to see the world through someone else's eyes. That's what genuine understanding is about. And that's what differentiates genuine understanding from judgment. Okay, so in, I think it was the first video, we made a distinction between genuine understanding and judgment. And I said something like, well, most of the time we don't understand each other. Most of the time what we're doing is judging each other and then mistaking our judgments for actual understanding. But what is not happening most of the time is actual understanding. Most of the time we aren't making a sincere and deep effort to see the world the way other people see the world. Okay. Instead, what are we doing? Well, we're rushing to the safety of our own judgments. And uh, one of the um, points of linkage between empathy and acceptance is this, like when you understand someone else's world, not all the time, but fairly often, it makes it easier to accept it. Okay. So being empathetic oftentimes, well, probably most of the time, makes it easier to accept another person what another person is going through. So an example, because maybe this seems a little bit abstract right now. So let's say like one of your friends um, acts like a real ass and pisses you off. Okay. So, and you're pissed off at your friend. Uh, then the next day you discover that, oh, um, your friend was act acting that way because he, his dog died. <laughs> You know, and that can really upset people. You know, we have such an intimate relationship with animals a lot of the time. Some of us do, not everyone. But, you know, uh, that really your friend was upset, not at you, and he wasn't trying to be an ass or anything like that. But his dog died and he was upset about that and it put him in a foul mood. And consequently, he wasn't quite as sensitive or as considerate, perhaps, as he normally is, let's say. And uh, But what's the point? The point here is... Uh, that understanding something like that, understanding what your friend is going through, trying to make an effort to see like what the world might have felt like through his eyes can actually make it easier to accept your friend. Why? Because you understand where it's coming from. That makes it easier to accept it. So he's not just a person acting like an ass anymore. He's a person who's suffering because his dog died and yeah, probably still acting like an ass, but it's easier to accept him at that point.
Okay. All right. So <laughs> there's a linkage. What's the point? There's a linkage between this empathy business and acceptance business. Now, the third camp uh, component is honesty. Okay. So number three, honesty. Now, uh, Rogers, uh, he sometimes has a funny way of talking about things. It might be a little old school, even for me, a dinosaur like myself. So he describes honesty in terms of a transparency fairly often. Okay. So, or um, congruence is another word that he loves. Okay. So uh, when he's talking about congruence or transparency, uh, really, I think a more straightforward word for that might be honesty. So what's honesty about? Well, it's um, saying what you really think and what you really feel and expressing what's really going on with you. Okay. So transparency in that sense that your client, let's say your client could see all the way through you. All right. So it's to really see what you're really thinking. So you're not like holding things sort of back or, you know, part of you sort of hiding in the corner or something like that. So it's not about that. So real talk <laughs> as it were. Okay. So now the thing is, um, it, let's say you're really good at all three of these and not everyone is for sure. Not everyone is very good necessarily at acceptance. Definitely not everyone is good at empathy. Definitely not everyone is good at honesty or transparent, but let's say transparency, but let's suppose that you are pretty good at that. And, uh, a client comes to you and so you offer this very accepting, empathetic and honest, unconditional, positive regard working in some of your early vocabulary there. The thing is that that does not guarantee any sort of immediate change. All right. Well, why not? Well, here's the thing about the clinical situation. Most of the time, especially if someone's coming to your office for the very first time uh, for therapy, uh, probably they're coming to you because they, their world is definitely not working. Their world is definitely falling apart. They're definitely in a lot of pain and or the people around them are in a lot of pain. Okay. So when people come to therapy for the uh, early sessions of the first time, usually they're in crisis. It's crisis that brings them to the therapist nine times out of 10. Okay. So people usually aren't going to walk into your office. It's like, well, I'm pretty well developed and I'd like to, you know, sort of work on that top 3% that I'm still missing. That is <laughs> by far <laughs> the exception. <laughs> Okay. That hardly ever happens. All right. So it's almost always in the mode of crisis that people will show up. So, um, when people are in the mode of crisis, man, they're just trying to make their world work like in a serious way. So, uh, although you're very good, let's say at offering these qualities, probably they're not going to be able to perceive what the hell it is you're offering right off. Okay. Cause they're in crisis management. They're in damage control mode probably in their lives. So they're not, they're probably not able to, to sort of sense and take in like this accepting, empathetic and honest atmosphere, except in the most sort of distant and tangential of ways that takes a little bit of time. So the client is probably too frightened, freaked out, stuck even to perceive what's being offered. So uh, in the short term, change is not at all guaranteed by this paradigm. The guarantee is in the long term. Okay. The guarantee is in the long term. So Rogers says it in a pretty categorical way. I mean, he, he goes, um, in the long haul change will invariably occur. And I put that in word invariably in your notes in big block letters to make sure not because I thought it was a vocabulary word. Well, if it is, it means always, it'll always occur. Change will always occur. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time um, before the client begins to change. Now, why is that? Well, because, because of the basic sort of framework we've already laid out in the previous videos that, you know, basically what we're all, what we're all doing in being human, <laughs> in being alive is we're going through our lives moment by moment, day by day. And we're looking for uh, the times and places where we can really uh, move into the greater good of what we can possibly be in this world. All right. So we're always, according to Rogers, looking for the good and, and trying to attain the good for ourselves. We're always looking to grow. We're always looking to transcend ourselves. But the thing is the world we're inhabiting doesn't necessarily make that easy because, because a lot of the time the world is not very accepting. The world is not very empathetic. 
The world is not very honest. Sorry, I apologize that you were born into this universe where those kinds of things are true. I apologize on behalf of the freaking universe that you were born as a human being where those things are relative rarities. So, uh, but even though they're rarities, they sometimes happen. And basically what we're doing is we're looking for the, the, the right kind of situation and the right kind of conditions where we can really sort of enter fully into life and transcend ourselves and grow beyond our limitations. And uh, therapy is basically about providing those right conditions. That's the project of psychotherapy, providing the kind of right conditions where, it, where it, it's very conducive to our transcending, to our growing. Because we're looking for a place where we're really seen, we're really understood, that's the empathy component. At the same time, we're really accepted, that's the acceptance component, and there's an honest dialogue about things. So you don't have to worry about all the damn gamesmanship, and you don't have to worry about all the sort of anxieties about hierarchical positions like, am I good enough, am I this or that, or am I nice enough, or am I whatever, smart enough, blah, blah, blah. So you can drop all that kind of crap and be what you are. Like that's what we're really looking for, ultimately, like the kinds of relationships. And think about it, you know, not just in terms of, of psychotherapy, think about it in terms of, let's say, love relationships or friend relationships. And ask yourself, isn't that what you're really looking for? You know, in your love relationship, well, okay, you're looking to get laid at some point. I understand that. Even older people like myself are too. Okay, so, but beyond that, like, aren't you really looking for to be accepted, to be seen, to be understood, to be appreciated, to be valued for what you are, and in the midst of that, to have some, uh, some irreducible uh, amount of honesty in it, you know? And if you're not looking for that in your love and friend relationships, well, you know, <laughs> maybe you might. Maybe you might. Maybe that'll be, that might be a different, a cool goal. Now, um, uh, all right, so we're starting to head toward the straightaway to the finish line of chapter two. I told you we were going to start going through these a little bit faster. So um, on page 36 of On Becoming a Person, uh, he lists a bunch of outcomes, like concrete outcomes that he's found by way of researching uh, how good client-centered therapy, also known as person-centered therapy, is. And because I care about you, <laughs> The tuition-paying West Georgia student, I've uh, summarized those in an easy-to-understand, easy-to-study list, uh, but I'm taking them from page 36. So here's the list, and it's in your notes. So, um, okay, how can we frame this? All right, so uh, outcomes of client-centered therapy. So uh, to become more integrated and effective as a human being, more integrated, more whole, and more effective in your life, not bad. Uh, to come into a better self-perception, okay, more positive and more accurate. Uh, valuing yourself more highly as opposed to not valuing yourself very highly. Uh, to be more confident, eh, not a bad outcome. Uh, to be more open to experience, to what life is actually trying to show you, less closed off, all right. To have a better understanding of ourselves. <laughs> My goodness. To be more accepting of others. More accepting of others. Man, I think the world could do with a little bit of that these days. To be behaviorally more mature as opposed to more infantile or childish. To be, to be less easily frustrated so you can sort of deal with stress and hardships more easily and be less frustrated by them. To be less defensive. Okay. And to be more adaptable. My goodness. Like... If you have a lot of that going on in your life, that's not a bad thing. Now, I, the, I want to end this video by reading. Um, I just clicked on the PDF format so I can read the free one I told you about. On page uh, 37 and 38, uh, kind of a, uh, a large uh, if-then statement he has, a way of summarizing all this stuff we've been talking about in Chapter 2 in terms of a large if-then statement. So. Uh, there's going to be a big if thing and then a big then thing. All right, so here it is, bottom of page 37. If I can create a relationship characterized on my part by a genuineness and transparency in which I am my real feelings, 
by a warm acceptance of and prizing of the other person as a separate individual, and by a sensitive ability to see his world and himself as he sees them, then the other individual in the relationship, like the client, will experience and understand aspects of himself which previously he has repressed, so you, you understand more of the depth of who and what you are, will find himself becoming better integrated, more able to function effectively in the world, okay? will become more similar to the person he would like to be, okay, so you become more like the person that you would hope to be in this life, <laughs> will become more self-directing and self-confident, in other words, not just acting like a damn puppet on the strings of other people and following orders and all of that kind of stuff, you become sort of more of an autonomous, unique human being, will become more of a person, more unique and more self-expressive, right? So you become more of who you really are, okay? So you're not just a clone of other people. You're not just a cookie cutter of other people, all right? will become more understanding and more acceptant of others, even if those others think a little bit differently from how you do, or see things a little bit differently, or have different values, or whatever. Like, you're more able to accept other people for who and what they are, even if they're not much like you. We'll become more able to cope with the problems of life more adequately and more comfortably. Okay, so not a bad... Uh, set of uh, desiderata. <laughs> desiderata. Okay, so uh, once again, let's improve your vocabulary. My God, you're going to crush the freaking GREs. I mean, you're going to take the GREs. It'll be amazing. You'll crush them like a little tiny walnut with little flakes of walnut falling in your lap. And get a high score. Okay, <laughs> so uh, desiderata is, means things that uh, to be desired. Let's put it that way. All right, desideratum is the singular. So it's, if it's one thing, like a desideratum or desiderata means multiple things. Okay. Anyhow, okay, with that little vocabulary lesson, didn't know I was going to go there, but there's a certain spontaneity even in these videos. All right, take care. Have a great day. Next video, chapter three, like you couldn't anticipate that. Have a good one. Bye-bye.